Hey guys, Chuck and Stacy here with VO Buzz Weekly, and what's happening, Stace? We have phenomenal actor, voice director, and dialect coach, J.B. Blanc. Wow. Lots to learn today, so let's get buzzed. Turn it up. Get ready. You're tuned in to VO Buzz Weekly. Weekly. And now, prepare to get seriously buzzed with your hosts, Chuck Duran and Stacy J. Aswan. So you guys, our guest is a dynamic theater film and television actor. You also love him voice acting in anime, animation, and video games. Tons of them. And he's also a respected voice director and dialect coach. Are you ready? Because we're going to get buzzed right now with the fabulous J.B. Blanc. Woo. Wow. Woo. You hear the crowd screaming? Yeah, unbelievable. I Look mean, at that so studio you audience. Th exactly. exactly. I can't hear you. Dude, thank you so much for coming down We're and so happy hanging out you. with us. The honor is all mine. This is so cool. Of course, it's I mean, great. we know that you're like pretty swamped, aren't you? Mm. A little busy, a little, little busy. busy. Yeah, when the sun shines. When the sun shines, when the sun shines. which is a beautiful thing. <laughs> um, so, and Stacy and I, man, we were watching some of your video stuff so uh, during the last few days just to look at like some of the stuff that you're doing. And man, you have to be proud of some of the crazy stuff that you've done. I'm English. We're not allowed to be proud. Whatever. Well, we hide I our lights under a bushel. You're not English. <laughs> English. <laughs> you have a green I'm card? English. <laughs> He's I'm English. English. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to be a citizen early in 2017. Yay! Yay! We're so happy to have you. That's it took good, 15 man. years of being here to wow. decide finally to do what it. What was it that put you over the edge? The coffee bean? Or <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the coffee bean, to be honest. Not the tea leaf. They're just the coffee bean. Yeah. yeah. So good. Um, well, I love how you, you know, when you look at, first of all, like your on-camera work, you can be so many different ethnicities. Forget even the accents and the dialects that you do. But you are, I mean, we've seen you be a Mexican doctor. We've seen you be Middle Eastern. We, I mean, it's just like incredible. Yes, I call it my stop me in the airport looks. <laughs> Stop me in the airport looks. Stop me looks. in the airport looks. Yeah, I get flagged a lot because I look like every them? dodgy. Man. I know, right? It's like, <laughs> well, wait a I'm minute. Half, could he be? I'm half Middle Eastern. I'm, I'm half you? Lebanese, and so my passport right. picture looks like I have done something right. But wrong. Le Lebanese don't really count. They're the party. They're the partiers of the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're the fun, they're the fun Arab <laughs> yeah. guys, Arabs and Christians. We have great food too. Great food. <laughs> um, yeah, but I might see you on the side. Yeah, yeah, I get, we'll, we'll get patted I get the down pat together down. sometime. I get, Absolutely. I get well, let's get down, down to it. I got bit. some questions. I got okay. some questions. Um, so, so you were born in France. I was. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> you were born, I in, you were born, born in France, yeah. raised in the UK. Yeah. So take us back a little bit okay. and give us a little bit of, you know, how you grew up and, you know, how things developed and what led you to Los Angeles. Okay. Can you do that? It's a long story. I can. You're going to let uh, him talk. Now you can talk. you got can, two minutes. Yeah. Go. No. 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 Okay. Um, so, yeah, I was born in Paris. My, my mother uh, met a Frenchman while she was working for BP in Paris, and he swept her off her feet. And then she realized that he was very French. Mm. And so uh, they divorced when I was very young. And we moved to England and stayed with my aunt in North Yorkshire, which is about halfway between London and Scotland. A little more towards Scotland, right. and I, I ended up growing up in a, in a. My mother remarried, and we grew up in. I grew up in a tiny little village in Yorkshire of about four hundred people. Wow, that's mm. tiny. But it did have two pubs, so that was all right. That's that's big. Mm, just for in tiny. a village. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they like they take the drinking very seriously. Yes. Yeah, we don't drink breast milk. It's 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 beer that comes <laughs> out of the beer. mother's <laughs> mother's boob when you're young. Um, and I and I uh, my. Uh, we, we didn't have money, but my mum inherited some money and put me in a, a posh private boarding school for boys only, which was a very, very old place, uh, founded in 1555, somewhere up near the Scottish border wow. in Cumbria, which is an extraordinary place to be. Yeah. When you're a kid, you you just get me out of here. Please Absolutely. get me out. In the village How old I grew were you up, when this happened? Well, I was at boarding school from the age of seven okay. to the age of 18. Wow. Yeah, and I, I, when wow, I looked man. at my seven-year-old kid, I was just, I can't imagine sending her away, but that was a different mm. time. And yeah. Particularly in England, they thought that was very good for your development. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and so it was this kind of archly conservative environment, but within this archly conservative environment, you get these little lefty English teachers who are very kind of revolutionary and slightly commie and slightly right. want to, you know. And... They, we started doing plays, and I started, I did some sort of like Gilbert and Sullivan musicals and stuff like that, stuff that you kind of do. Mm. Um, and uh, and I, I just felt at home there. I felt I wouldn't, I wasn't really, you know, growing up in the seventies and being a French kid wasn't pleasant in England. I was, you know, anything, you know, what it's like when you're a kid. You just don't want to be singled out for anything. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it was tough. I got called the N word at school. I mean, just because I was slightly darker than the average really? kid. Yeah, this is the seventies in England. Yeah, we're talking like you know, seventy four, seventy five. Like neighbor. They call and you did neighbor. And did you speak with a French accent? They called me neighbor. They called me neighbor. I can't believe they would call Get you out of here, neighbor. neighbor. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. No, neighbor. they called him Nutella. Nutella. Nutella, um, Nutella neighbor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you speak with a French accent? Um, no, I had to, uh, when I was very, very young, but I, I had to learn English properly to go to school, and so, mm -hmm. and, and you, in order to not be different, I kind of eliminated any kind of hint of French there might be, right. um, and I, that may have been where I been where I started that was sort of the getting a bit of an ear. You know? yeah. 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 Well, my greatness, but yeah, mediocrity certainly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was in this sort of posh school, and there were these little revolutionary English teachers who were like just started going, I think you might have something that might be useful in that arena. And I didn't even know that you could be an actor. I mean, I watched actors on TV, but I didn't think that was a job you could do. Right. Um, and there were a couple of teachers in particular, and, and it sort of culminated when I, I, I did a, a play called The Zoo Story by Edward Albee, an American piece, foretelling the future maybe, and just felt like I'd slotted into a niche that was mine. It was just, I felt a, truly at home. Um, and I was, you know, I was bullied at school, and it was kind of tough. I was a sort of mediocre sportsman and a and a, and a, a bit of a musician. I was a singer. I was a trained opera singer, or I, I'd had you the can't beginning be of it. Bullied if you're a singer, any kind of a singer. <laughs> Singers don't get bullied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind Those of thing. Those are singer. the cool dudes. The choir boys get bullied. Um, <laughs> I was head chorister. I mean, it was kind of weird. Mm. So I was kind of part of the establishment and not at the same time, and and always felt slightly displaced. But I was growing up in a country that really didn't feel like it was where I came from, right. even though it was very clearly kind of, I mean, it's, I always say I'm sort of culturally English, but my blood is very French, very much French. Right. And I didn't really see my father much when I was young, and I, I re-met him when I was, much later when I was 24, um, and got back in touch with that French side. But um, there was an English teacher there called Stuart Manger, and he said, there's this thing called the National Youth Theatre, you can go and try out, and it's in London, which was, you know, another world for us. Yeah. Um, and I tried out and I got in. And you did this sort of uh, summer course of four or five weeks, and you put on a production, and I was hooked. And the actor had trained at RADA, and, and I, was, I was like, what do you do at drama school? He said, you do this. And I was like, I've, that's something that's I have to I do. I have yeah. to do it, yeah. And so I went back up to Yorkshire, and I would sort of let all my... Um, my university applications, you know, the stuff that my parents thought I should do, um, I'd sort of let that go to the wayside, and I, I carried on doing plays a bit. I think I nearly got kicked out of school, because I was just, that was just what I wanted to do, and I was much more focused on the plays than the work. All my report cards at school were like, he's very intelligent, he's very smart, but bone idle, he doesn't care about any he's of this. And I, they were right, I didn't care about the schoolwork. Mm. Um, and I was sort of, I was doing like headmasters concerts and singing in choirs, and I was doing a, a little bit of performing, but it kind of terrified me. Um, because again, it was being singled out, and I didn't really yeah. want to be. It was weird. I was shy, but I was an actor, and I didn't know. The only way I could, what I later discovered, was to put that into a character. That's the disguise. That's not me anymore. Mm -hmm. If it's me, I get frightened. Right. But if it's a character, it's much easier for me to of course. to jump in. And then, sort of towards the end of my school. Um, I sort of in, I harped on at my mom so hard that I wanted to go to drama school, and she was like, oh, okay. So we rang around some drama schools, and they were all, it was all the end of the auditions. There was no way I was getting in. I'm like 17 at the time. And uh, it, was the end, it was the end of audition season, so there was no chance. And then RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, called us back and said, there's been a cancellation on the last day of auditions. Do you want to come down? Yes, I said. It's in three days. So I did a piece from the zoo story that I'd done at school, and I did a piece from Henry IV Part Two, because I'd done that at school for A-level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I did a song, I did an aria for, uh, from Mozart. Mm. And I think I frightened them to death. And somehow <laughs> I got in. And you got in. Yeah, by some miracle. Miracle or destiny. Mm. Who knows? For some and it's a, it's a rigorous, I mean, like, Rudder's not messing about. It's, yeah. it's, it was the only one I, I was auditioning for, but they have like three or 4,000 people audition for 25 places every right. year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there were only 75 kids in the, in the drama school. It was in George Bernard Shaw's old house that he'd given to Rada all those years ago, which right. is very strange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fantastic. Those, the, the, the walls smell of it. You know, it's, it's an incredibly historic place. Yeah. Um, and you go back and you do various workshops. And, and then uh, I, 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 they told me I'd got in. And, and I was, it was a sort of, oh my God, what now? Um, but anyway, I, I moved down to London. 
in a van from my stepfather's work with a driver who was terrified to, look, to, to drive in London, so I drove myself <laughs> into London. We found the, the apartment. And I lived in a, you know, awful sort of, you know, one bedroom, tiny top flat in, in London in yeah. Hackney. And London was very different then. It was tough. It was, you know, yeah. it was pretty hardcore. It was like New York used to be, not quite, but, but close. Yeah. Um, and Rudder was the most extraordinary place. It was, you, you literally ate, slept and breathed acting 24 seven. Um, it was a very strict place. You clocked on in the morning at it's 8 a.m. like a AM. Juilliard of, mm -hmm. right? Very much so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 and uh, and you clocked on, and if you were late once, you were in front of the principal. If you twice, you could be get kicked off the course. Right. Um, but I was, you know, a kid. I was eighteen. I was the youngest guy to get in that year, and you know, there was a whole new world of freedom to me. So I, I it's not that I kind of screwed up, rather, but I didn't, I didn't think I placed as as close attention as I could have. Did you get kicked out? I did not get kicked no, out. No, he graduated. Okay. No, okay. I did graduate. I was okay. fine. Yeah, they they they, they you tolerated You appreciated me for it that more one. after probably. <laughs> yeah. But it's what it's not what you what you find is it's not what you learn at the time is what sinks in over the okay. time Absolutely. and you know 5 years later I'd be standing on a stage and go Oh, oh that, that's what they were talking <laughs> about. I get it. Yeah. 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 But then when I when I when I came Glad, out of Rada, there wasn't yeah. any work. Theatres were closing all, that, all around the country. I didn't have an agent. I was uh, my mother had got sick, and I went up and looked after her. So I kind of missed out on the agent run that everyone else was doing. And then I met some students from Lambda and a couple from Rada. Lambda is another drama school in London, who were setting up a theatre company for actors who who'd specifically left accredited drama schools, accredited drama schools, so that they had a place to perform. Cool. You know, London's like New York, it has a huge fringe yeah. theatre area. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where I started cutting my teeth. We, we found a basement in Paddington, we gutted it, we painted it black, we l put up lighting rigs. Mm -hmm. Good colour, black. We built a theatre, yep. love the black. And uh, built a theatre and, and started putting on productions. Mm -hmm. And we got pretty well known. We were compared to some great theatre companies, we did some tours, we did, I did a great play about Lizzie Borden. Uh, an American, another American piece. Uh, we took that to Hong Kong, um, and uh, and that was a sort of four or five year period of running that theatre. Yeah. One of the guys who became a director at that theatre with me, um, and we used to have holes in our boots, and we'd smoke single strand roll up cigarettes, you know, <laughs> huddling over hot cups of tea. <laughs> I mean, I was poor, poor, poor. I was yeah. eating rice to, to yeah. just to run this yeah. theatre. Um, he's now the artistic director of the Royal National Theatre. Wow. <laughs> Rufus Norris, yeah. Mm, now he's having risotto. I yeah, was now he's having risotto. <laughs> risotto. Risotto. Yes, and probably with the odd truffle grating yeah, jelly. Exactly, right? <laughs> um, but so, so it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, it's weird how we turn yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, And then I kind of embarked on a bit of, a bit of national theatre, rural, rural theatre in, in, in England, in the UK. I worked in Stoke and, and a few towns around the UK doing repertory, what used to be called repertory theatre. Yeah. Um, tough gig, you know, not a lot of money. And then I, I sort of washed up at the end at the National Theatre. And I got uh, a job with a very brilliant director called Howard Davis, who only died a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I was suddenly part of a, what was kind of the National Theatre Company. And I spent five years there, uh, three, no, three and a half years, and I did about four or five shows. Right. Um, crazy place, because they have three theatres in the building, and often three shows in each theatre at any given time. So one show will run for eight shows, they'll take the set out, put another set in, mm. run another one for eight, take that out. And at one point, there were times where I was rehearsing one play during the day and performing two different plays at night. Mm. And you just, you, as we say in England, you don't know your ass from your elbow. You're so <laughs> tired, it's just like this, you're just blundering through, but by gum do you get your you know, you get your, your kind of comeuppance, you understand yeah, yeah. just what that kind of driven yeah. hard, mm -hmm. you, you know, be there, you don't miss a show, you're mm -hmm. not allowed to call in sick, you're just there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was an extraordinary time because it's such an institution. I got to meet Ian McKellen and Ben Kingsley and Judy Dench and, I mean, all these incredible people and yeah. work with mm -hmm. some of them. Yeah. Um, so that was, it was extraordinary. It culminated in two productions of Greek tragedies directed by a guy called Sir Peter Hall, who started the Royal Shakespeare Company. It's all very boring theatre theater talk, which I thought right. was going to be the most amazing experience of my life. Yeah. It was not. Um, <laughs> it was a nasty experience. We, we, uh, we actually opened the, the production in Epidavros in Greece in a 15,000 seat oh amphitheatre. Oh my, how authentic of yeah. you. Right behind the burial grounds of Delphi. And when, wow. we, we went over there and rehearsed all night and performed two shows at the end of the week to 10,000 people, which wow. was extraordinary. Yeah, amazing. That's in really full cool. mask. Wow. Full Greek tragic marks and all this stuff. 
I came out of that experience and I was not happy. I was pretty miserable. I, I'd done a lot of touring. I'd worked a lot of theatre. I was exhausted. Theatre is a tough game. I couldn't still pay my bills even though I yeah. was at the National Theatre, mm -hmm. which should have been kind of the top of my game. Uh, it was the West End London, you know. But, you know, London got increasingly expensive and it was, it was tough. And I'd had, a, had some bad experiences on that production and I was a bit disillusioned. And a friend of mine said, listen, I've got this web design company. Why don't you come and work for me? I was doing the odd bits of voiceover. The only voiceover I'd ever done was corporate stuff for, their, right. for what they, they used to call CD-ROMs. Right, right. <laughs> I remember those. Yes. CD-ROMs. And it'd be stuff like medical equipment and, yeah. you know, yes. all that kind of, yeah. you know, dog work. <laughs> And so I, I did that, and then he sort of put me into sales and started, and I, I ended up, I was there for two and a half years, I ended up as accounts director for the company. Oh my. And had, you know, great wage in a company car. And two and a half years, and I literally wanted to stab myself in the face. I was, <laughs> I had a, gr I had a great wage. You had to be a creative car. person and throw yeah. me in a freaking yeah. really, like that. I just wanted to shoot myself. And so this is how it went down. I came home from work, and I was sitting on the couch, and I was just thinking, oh my God, what have you done? You used to have like, fire in your eyes and yeah. passion mm. and you used to love what you were doing and, yeah. and now you've just how you you've let your agent go you've let everything how you've lost all your contacts and the phone rang i swear to god on this second mm. and i picked up the phone and i went hello hi jb this is priscilla john do you remember me and i said yeah i remember you she's a casting director she said uh are you still working i hadn't worked for two and a half years sure uh, <laughs> yes yes i am what why <laughs> She says, there's this movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. The director's coming oh. into town. I, I don't know. I think there might be some stuff in there. Do you want to meet him? And I went, yes. Yes, I, I do. I really, really want to meet him. I bit her arm off, basically. Yeah. yeah. And so I met Kevin Reynolds, um, and he was, he was, he's very dry and from Texas. He's like, your stuff's really good, man. Um, I, I don't know how I'm going to get you in this movie, but I want you in this movie. We're going to do this, so we'll figure it out, okay? I was like, okay, all right. And originally I was up for the part that Luis Guzman played. By the way, played. anytime you talk about anybody else there's a different dialect today, <laughs> you're going to do, do it, it. Gonna do it in their dialect. All right? Because right. that's what this guy's the king at. Uh, I forgot to do the Lebanese. <laughs> they were going to do that. Do that do do what are you doing? We oh, made the hummus I baked for you, all right? Very nice, sweetheart. Very good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Marhaba. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so... so, so uh, so originally I was I was I was gonna do Luis Guzman's part and uh, Luis Guzman he's a phenomenal mm -hmm. actor. Yeah. Yo, JB, come to my uh, my trailer. We're gonna get, listen to some Santana. Get your lunch. We will listen to some Santana, man. It's gonna be great. Santana. Santana, you love Santana. Um, and uh, I went. We shot that in Ireland and Malta. Uh, they got me. Uh, yeah. Eventually, I got the part of Luigi Vampa, who's this sort of ne'er do well pirate who comes back and it dots out through the, throughout the movie and suddenly I'd landed this you know great role in this yeah. movie great role. I was paid appallingly badly for it because the <laughs> British equity is not a great strong union so most right. British actors on American movies are on kind of crappy equity buyouts I think I made £6,000 for that entire film mm. which is only three and grand no residuals mm. oh, never, oh. never had a residual oh, I'm wow. having a pain yeah. Oh. Yeah, I like. and that thing never stops <laughs> playing it's on Man. all the time but the good thing is, I'm not bitter. Right. No. Well, they, no, no. I mean, they got you out of jail. <laughs> you spent six thousand pounds in therapy, and you got you through go. it. Yeah, yeah, the so you're like, even. You're, it's a wash. Completely, exactly. man. <laughs> so when Cannibal Crusoe was coming out, I was like, uh, Hollywood adaptation of a great European novel. It's not going to do well in Europe. Yeah. Maybe. I and Kevin, Kevin said. Am I going to have to do him again? You know, she come and have a look at L.A. No, he, he said, you should come and have a look at L.A. I think you'd do okay. Come and stay. Why don't you stay with my assistant? Come over for mm. 10 days. Have a look. See what you think. I came awesome. over. This was uh, about 2000. And, about 2000. And uh, so I knew one person. And I had a look around and I thought, sunshine, palm trees, potential career. Mm. It was amazing because I, I could call people up and say I was in the Camp of Monte Cristo. And they were like, oh, yeah, no, let's have lunch. And in England, I'd always felt in, in England as an actor that I was part of some sort of game. And it was a lottery. I threw dice and maybe I scored. And then I felt if I did the job, I was sort of doing someone else a favor. Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a business. And people frowned on actors in England, even though it's got this great tradition. It was sort of, you know, well, you know, my, my parents' friends would sort of say, yeah, sort of acting, not very much money in that, is that? It's more of a, more of a jolly, really. Isn't right, it? right. Mm -hmm. And when I got to America, it was a business. It was a real mm -hmm. business. And, you know, you were something to be marketed. And that took me a while to get my head wrapped around. Yeah. 
So I came over for the 10 days, had a look, and thought, sod it. I went home, I sold everything I had, and I moved. And I arrived here. I stopped off in New York to see friends. Uh, this was August of 2001. I did a bit of tourism, because I'd done tourism in New York, and I yeah. went up one of the towers. Mm. And then I flew here, and 10 days later, 9-11 happened. Mm. Wow. Mm. And... It sort of changed everything in terms of, you know, I was Absolutely, arriving here like, I'm going to be a star. <laughs> and uh, the movie got pushed mm. and the country went into a different place. And yeah. it was a very interesting time to arrive yeah. in, in the U.S. It yeah. definitely was. Yeah. yeah. So that was how I, that's how I got here. Mm. Yeah. Wow. But the, the important thing is you arrived. And I did, I suppose. You did, yeah. and your and life changed. And now you're a citizen, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah. Of course, um, when I arrived, no, uh, you know, uh, custom directors would say, because I, no, I had nothing on tape. I had yeah, no yeah. on-camera stuff, and I wasn't doing voiceover yet. Mm. So they, I had a clip from the Gala Monte Cristo, and, and so, so what have you been doing? Theater. Oh. So theater, how does that work? That's honestly, that's what the sort of questions I would get. Wow. Now people uh, go, oh, th you've done theatre, great. Yeah, theatre, yeah. You know, but it was a bit, it was a bit misunderstood. Yeah. It was a bit like they didn't really know what to do with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I found an agent who was theatre aware, uh, and I, I joined them. Here. And, yeah, here, mm -hmm. and uh, and I didn't, I wasn't working. It was very tough. And then I met a guy. Well, my friend Victoria, who was the person who I was at drama school with, was doing this anime series called Helsing. Mm. Mm -hmm. And she said, they're looking for English voices, why don't you come along and have, have a go? And I went, up. all right, so I did. And I met, I met Crispin Freeman and I met Taz and Jaffe and, and I got the part of this, he was called the Cheddar Priest, I you think. You met Crispin Freeman when he was like, what, 17? Set, yeah. Isn't he still? <laughs> he's he just still, looks permanently he's still, 17. <laughs> no, yeah, he's he permanently 17. He <laughs> exactly. He was playing uh, Alucard, yeah. uh, which was Dracula backwards, except the Japanese wanted to call him Arucard because they said Dracula. Yeah. And Dracula. so we had to convince them that it was Alucard, yeah. not Arucard. Yeah. Um, and I played this sort of Cheddar Gorge priest who was this sort of very kind of nasty individual who said things like, I know you're feeling pain, but I will give you pleasure and it will last forever. Nice. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I played this sort of demonic Vatican envoy called Maxwell. Mm. And uh, and that was that was my first sort of foray into voiceover really that, of anything that hadn't been Cool. Right, that's right. cool. So well, and plus you're doing dubbing, which is the hardest. So one you of the go hardest from things to do. theater and film to not just voiceover but dubbing yeah. anime, which is its own beautiful craft. Anyway, yeah. so Certainly what is. was that? I mean, and even now, I mean, you transition so beautifully between on camera and voiceover. But did you have any misconceptions, or what was that transition like for you? I think the beauty of it was that I didn't have any preconceptions whatsoever. Mm. I was being sent in to do a job. I think, I will say that theatre teaches you to be very adaptable. Yeah. And particularly as I run my own company, you're constantly leaping in and out of everything. You right. know, you're, you're doing right. every job, every, every everything that you can. And I was here, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to work in America in whatever capacity I could. Yeah. And so I went in with my eyes very firmly open and a perspective of learning mm -hmm. and I still do to this day I still yeah. kind of assume that I know nothing yeah to leave myself open to whatever mm -hmm. you know is going to come my of way of course um, but it was I was suddenly it was technically quite tricky yeah. you know the beeps the format the the mit matching flap uh, trying to get these characters I, I went away and studied anime and, uh, a little bit to try and figure out what it was as a performance art mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it seemed to turn out great. And then I, I started doing little bits of more anime. And then they asked me to direct a, a very bizarre series called Licensed by Royal. I think because it was set in England, they thought mm -hmm. I'd be good at directing it. So I directed that anime. Um, and in the meantime, I was sort of trying to get my papers together and get, I got an O1 visa, which is a, an artist visa to be here. Because when, when you're coming from abroad, you don't exist. You don't yeah. have credit right. history. You don't have social security right. number. Yeah. You don't have a driver's license. You know, you got to do all that stuff and try and exist legitimately in the United States. I'm basically a dreamer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so at the same time, I started going out on TV things. And the first job I got was in the last season of NYPD Blue. And I was so happy because I used to watch that as a sort of drunken yeah. student after I came home from the pub, 
you know, and, and this yeah. was and it was this hour long character development, which was fairly new in TV yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I got to meet Sipowitz and I got to do the thing and I paid a guy from Brooklyn and I figured like if I fooled them, I was going to be OK. Totally, I couldn't believe man. I got the job. Mm. Yeah. So good. I'm actually amazed. Like when you play these different characters, it's just like. Wait so, a minute. Yeah. How could he do that? Because you be you really become like the real thing, man. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Well, um, and physicality too. Absolutely. Not just taking I out mean, the accent. Th did this happen just by you know you just getting jobs and adapting and doing it, or were you strategically teaching yourself how to do these different things so that you could so that that could be like a tool? No, I mean you know I'm not the first voice actor to walk in here and tell you that they learned to do voices by doing impressions of people to get out of yeah, trouble. Yeah. Right. So I would do impressions of teachers. I would take people off, and I had a and I was a musician, so I had, I had an ear. Right. Um, the, uh, he said ear, by the way, for those of you who didn't <laughs> I had understand an ear. the accent. Ear. I had an he ear. has an ear. He had an ear. <laughs> Ear, ear. <laughs> you made me feel so posh now. Oh, this was a huge You're mistake. So, I should never have come. So he's so fancy. He should have never come. He talks so fancy. <laughs> All right, Chuck, let's... don't heckle. We're not heckling. That's what the but studio we're... audience is doing. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're loud enough. <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, yeah, I had an ear for dialect. I mean, actually, the, the, the dialect, oh, this is going to be very annoying, but the dialect was not something I found too difficult. It was getting in the mindset of other characters. Mm -hmm. and, and I always had a, you know, the theater company was a physical theater company. Yeah. So there are companies like Theatre de Complicité that are very physical, and you know, it would be be a chair, be a pig, be a lamppost, be do stuff, you know, just, just changing up. Mm -hmm. There would be very few props and everyone would provide what was going on on stage. Right. Um, so that was very open to sort of improvisational skills, to adapting very quickly, taking on things very quickly. And, you know, accents are characters in their own right yeah. too. So. I, when I'm, if I'm teaching, sometimes I'll say, you know, you need a bit, you need to shrug a bit more in a French accent because right. you know the French they are like that. Yeah. Screw yeah. you! I won the World Cup. Uh, it's no problem, you know. Um, uh, Russians are are deeply pained about the mother country. So if you put that into the accent, why you are doing this? What you do? But please don't do this. Right. Even if you're a villain, there's something sort of entreating yeah. about mm -hmm. a Russian accent. You know, they really yeah. want you to. Um, so, so it was that kind of it, that physical training helped with that that kind of approach to character, really. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't really matter what medium you're working in; you're just telling stories. No matter yeah, right. what you're, yeah. you know, what you're doing, it, you might adapt slightly to the different s styles of yeah. media. Um, and anime is its own little bit, and t TV animation is its own little bit, and video games are something else, and right. TV and film are different. Yeah. So you, you're constantly having to adapt and change. So, mm. and, and people like, whenever there's like a, like, you know, video game director, producer, whatever, anybody needs to be coached through some dialects and stuff like that, you're like one of the go-to guys that they send people to, don't they? I was there for a hot minute. I mean, yeah. uh, I was doing it for a bit. Um, I did it for about, I mean, I was very lucky. I started, I started thinking, I, I know all this stuff about dialects, I should yeah. coach. Mm -hmm. And one of the first gigs I got was coaching for a production of the History Boys at the Amundsen Theatre, uh -huh. which was all American cast. We had to make them British and sound like they were from Sheffield, which is basically the dialect they have in the Full Monty, if you've seen that. Right. Yes. It's, I describe the dialect as a wet cloth hitting a street. <laughs> it lands. Everything's flat. Yeah, everything's and flat. Lands. Yeah. Um, and as a consequence of me doing that, the LA Times did a double page spread of me doing, of all about me doing the dialects for the yeah. show. And I had an instant dialect coaching business. Of course. And uh, and so I, I started I, yeah, I started it in that but you know it's always it's always hard because I, I had a voiceover career that I wanted mm -hmm. to pursue I had a, an on camera career that I was still trying to pursue I still am yep um, and so it was it was always a juggle and it was a question of and I and I don't like letting people down so if I'm if someone's taking me on I want to be consistent I want to be there I want to be able to support yeah. them because it shouldn't just be a one off um, and then you know. I got a lot of sort of fans who wanted to be in the business but weren't really ready for dialect coaching before exactly. they'd started acting yeah, training, yeah, really. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and so that felt didn't feel too good. And then I just got really stupid busy. And I couldn't really afford to teach anyone. I didn't have the time. So I sort of let it go. Now it's great because I, my mates come to me. Right. So they come, you know, all my friends in, in VO, if they need a dialect, then, then they'll call me so up. So you're really just working with like some well, of the top friends. I, I, don't even yes. I don't even charge them. It's, I just, it's you just, don't charge? No, no, I just, I See, that's out. why I like English well, people, man. 
<laughs> well, no, and many of them have mentioned you on the show. You've been, your, your name has been mm -hmm. swirling here for a while. Um, do you have any, for people that are watching, mm -hmm. um, I think it's an interesting point that the acting layer has to be intact before you try to put a different character or dialect on top of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, from the approach of someone coming into the business, mm -hmm. then get the acting right first every time. Yeah. I mean, and getting it right is a silly phrase to say. It's something you, you work on getting right until you fall over. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's an ongoing process. Um, but there's no point in just learning a dialect if you, if you don't understand anything about character or trying to, you know, really get inside a character and, and ask the right questions and right. be the investigator that you need to be as an actor. Mm. Right. Uh, and so it's a kind of, it's kind of, it's arse about tit, if you like, in terms of, in terms of, that's an English phrase, meaning it's the wrong way round, <laughs> children. Um, There's the translation. It's the wrong way to What he meant to right. say? No. <laughs> um. I'm going to get, I'm going to get a demand here waiting on this show. <laughs> in, in the Americas, we say upside down. Upside down. down. Um, so, like, but for anybody out there watching who's really trying to master, let's say they've got the acting shops going, are there any kind of just maybe a couple little tips about really getting into a dialect? How do you dissect it? It's so hard because each, each individual actor is different. And my approach to coaching for dialects was, and my approach to directing now, is what strength does that actor have to start with? Let's mm. start with what you've got. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it can be about facial shape, it can be about physicality, it can be about environment, it can be about weather, you know, things things are changed, people change the pace of the way they speak, you know, if you're yeah. a southerner, you speak much slower with this kind of heavy, you get that kind of Williams-esque draw, New Yorkers are, are faster and it's, you know, it's it's, it's a pace thing. Right. Um, the only way I can, the, the, the sort of the great word of wisdom. A lot, a lot of people ask for British accents, right? And there's a fundamental difference in the way that a British and an American actor accent works. Um, if I'm speaking with an American accent, everything kind of flattens out, and, and I'm speaking with an egg lying on its side at the back of my mouth. So what I say to people is that you kind of smile inside the mouth when you're doing an American accent. If you take that egg and you turn it on its end, you're working in a much more up and down manner at the back of the mouth, and we. You see, people think British people speak very quickly. We don't. We travel between the sounds further. So because there's so much travel going on, it sounds uh -huh. like you're speaking quickly because you're going forwards and backwards and up and down. Right. With American, you're kind of flattening out into, into the same kind of place. And I think it's why a lot of Brits are good at American accents because we're relaxing down into it. Mm -hmm. Americans having to reach up and use muscles that they don't normally use. Right. And they, exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, of course. Look at your egg flipping uh, up there. Sure I will. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I knew. It was well, but even the subtle nuances, and I think it was Mary Elizabeth McGlynn who said that, you know, you, you every region of England you, has a slight nuance that you, Of course, you know, yeah. I do, um, I do a little tour sometimes. Mm -hmm. You want to hear it? Yeah. Well, so, so I grew up in North Yorkshire. I mean, literally, I mean, if you go into detail, 20 miles down the road, they speak with a different dialect. Okay. It's nuts. <laughs> you know, it's a tiny yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are, you could fit three of them inside California. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's so if, if I start in North Yorkshire, which is sort of North East England, that's a very kind of practical farmer's way of talking. And if you go a bit further northeast, you get into like Newcastle, where they have this kind of strange influence that comes from, and you won't be able to understand a word I'm saying, I'm sure. But it comes from the like Nordic influences, so it sounds a little bit like the Swedish chef, you know. Right. Um, so it has that kind of bounce in it, you know. And mm. people are saying like, uh, oh, what's up, man? What are you talking about? I didn't talk like that, man. Which is very strange. Right, right. Then you get into sort of Eastern Scotland, which is which is kind of Edinburgh and very kind of genteel and kind of nice. And you go up into the Highlands where it gets really kind of raw down to Glasgow, which is much harder. Uh, what are you looking at? Your mother's so. <laughs> Right. Your mother's so well stitched <laughs> dash. Um, I play a character on a, a series called uh, uh, Dragons Race to the Edge, which is yeah. based on How to Train Your Dragons. Mm -hmm. And his name's Riker. And you, you can't have those dragons. I've got your dragons and they're mine now. Yeah. Just very good, sinister yeah. and dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you get down into sort of Lancashire, which has this sort of, it's where a lot of the bird are of American came from. Yeah. Yes. Where people like, you know, Blackburn and, and Clitheroe and cities like that. Uh, you've got Liverpool over there in the sort of northwest coast, where everyone talks like the Beatles, you know, they do down there, don't they, though? Um, and, uh, oh, come on, what's she doing? Shut up. 
um, that sort of stuff. <laughs> Manchester, which is where everyone talks a bit like it always is, you know, if you've got a thick Manchester accent, it goes much more into the nose like that. Right. Uh, I mean, I could go on. You go on to Wales, which has this lovely, rounded, yes. beautiful way in the southern southern Wales. And then you go to Mexico. <laughs> and you go like this, man, you know, where are you going to go? <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, oh so, I mean, you know, it goes on and on. That is so cool. Yeah, but it's, I mean, that's really wonderful. But, and I think, you know, we hear these regions all the time, so yeah. we're hearing different dialects all Have the time. Have you ever made, like, a recording of you traveling through the world? I haven't, no. You should do that. That would be outstanding. I would be happy to do that with you. On the tube we would, you. Buddy, yeah. that would be, you become a, a YouTube sensation. We'll produce that with you. Um, we, so, uh, that would be awesome. Whoever we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get to the important part of your story, <laughs> which is when you landed in Los Angeles and you found your way somehow to Chuck Duran. Mm -mm. Yeah, how did that to happen? Do a demo. I just followed my nose. It was the smell. I think. <laughs> um, the so uh, yeah, so the I, smell I, of well, I've done. I've been I've been sort of poodling around for okay. want of a better term in in anime, and and I, I was talking to people. Like Crispin and yeah. like Tennyson, and I was, I was I, well, this well, is something I, had I could with Crispin, do. So it might have been it him. It might have been said, him. Yeah, he yeah. said Jack Durant. I think it was, you know. Okay. Thanks, Crispin. Thanks, yeah, Crispin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a great guy. Um, by the way, Crispin, you're next. Yeah. You're going to be sitting in that chair mm -hmm. pretty soon. Uh -oh. um, Pick out your outfit. Keep it warm for you, love. Absolutely. So, so you came in and we did a commercial demo. Yeah, we did a commercial demo. Why a demo? commercial demo? Because, I mean. Well, because, uh, I, well, actually, I came in to talk to you and I was, I, I didn't have an agent. Okay. And I'd been doing some stuff and you listened to me and we talked and you said, I think in order to get an agent to get representation, sure. you need a commercial demo first. I think it's. I think people are more aware of games and animation than yeah. they were then because this was yeah. early days. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and so you were very clear that it was a commercial demo that I really needed to right. do. And I came in and you gave me all this copy and we just we it was collaborative. We talked, you know, yeah. and you figured out what what would be good. Yeah. And I was kind of. By the way, that was like in 2002. Two? Yeah. And because I, I just heard your demo not too long ago, I, I, I had to, like, oh my God. I had to go back in my database and check it out. <laughs> the and I gotta say, series. man, I listened to it. And I was like, oh my God! Like you were fantastic oh even God. back then. I'd never done the any. Sound the sound of your voice was just like so beautiful. Till even to this day, I have one of your spots. I, for, I think it was maybe a BMW spot or something like that. It's on oh, my website right now, Devils at Rock, as one of the samples because I love your voice so much. <laughs> Guess who never books commercially? Um, wait, you. let me think. Hardly ever. Mm. I mean, rarely, rarely. So what and happened I, uh, after that? Did you get an agent? Did you? Because I, I, yeah, I got an agent. Yeah, uh, I got. I sent that out, and I sent it out to a lot of agents who would love to represent me now, and they didn't yeah. even look at it. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, that's what happens. Yeah, you course, know, you've got you to know? keep yeah. going. You've got to yeah. keep going. Yeah. And I got response from from a small, medium sized agency. I'm not going to mention them. Um, and it, it, small, medium sized, the smaller side of, of, of medium sized. William Morris. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, and that was great. It was great yeah. to have representation. And and I started gigging. I, I think the first one of the first games I did was from Russia with Love. James Bond from Russia with Love. And I had a great part in it. Yeah. It was facial capture. It was all very new. I mean, I was thrown right into the fire. Yeah. yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. And I think it was. Because of the character work that I'd done mm -hmm. throughout my of career course, to that point, yeah, that, that really, mm -hmm. the link then to doing voice, whilst it was alienating to be in front of a microphone suddenly and, and to be locked in a in a room with mm -hmm. with thick glass with people talking about you on the other side, I, I sort of it so I felt I felt okay I felt like it was something I could link to and, and could mm -hmm. connect with. Mm -hmm. It was ironic that the, it was the commercial demo that got me an agent and then and then started working in. You know, in games, principally. Of course. Right. Chris Zimmerman gave me one of my first gigs. Um, Yutaka Masaba gave me some of my first gigs in anime and games up there at, uh, at uh, Magnitude 8 yeah. back in the day. Kevin Seymour, the lovely Kevin Seymour, who gave me some opportunities there as well. Um, but ultimately, as I and, I and I would run into, I ran into, for instance, one, uh, you may not have heard of him, a guy called, uh, um, is it Basker? B Baker, Troy, uh, Troy, Troy Baker? Troy Baker. T is he from Texas? <laughs> I think Something he's from like Texas that. too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I did a session with him and he looked at me and went, oh, uh, who are you? Where are you? Uh, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? Do you know yeah, so-and-so? Yeah. And I didn't. And he introduced me to about mm. four directors that I will be forever grateful to him for. Yeah. Um, and I just started putting myself around a bit. Um, 
years later, when I was, I said that I, I suddenly realised that I was hearing about projects. I was getting into a better calibre of work. I was hearing about projects often after they'd happened, yeah. and it came time. I'm deeply loyal, probably to a, to 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 a, a bad extent. It came time when I realised that I needed bigger, bigger, better representation. Yeah. So another one of these happy accidents in my life happened. I was working out at a gym with a trainer in New York, in, 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 uh, <laughs> and this Russian dude came up in to Studio him and said, City, <laughs> in Studio City, not a spit from right here. And there was this woman who used to work out next to me, and she'd walk, and this older guy would come and walk next to her, and we'd shoot the shit about the stupid television and the stupid politics and the stupid sports or whatever was going on, and we just chatted. And my trainer, who was a guy from New York, came up to me and said, uh, JB, you, you know who that is? I said, no, he said, you do, you do voiceover and shit, right? I was like, yeah, I do, I do voiceover. He goes, uh, that's uh, it's Arlene Thornton. Aww. I said, what? And I knew who she was. Yeah. We never got on name terms, but we mm. just sort of... So he said, you want me to have a word? And I said, yeah, sure, okay, well, yeah, all right, yeah, fine. <laughs> so she said, uh, so the next time we were walking on the treadmill, like this, she goes, so, I hear you do voices. You do voice work. I said, yeah, I do voice work. She said, uh, are you happy? I said, no, I'm not happy. She said, oh, we should talk. Mm. Do you have stuff? I said, I have stuff. So I sent her, Chuck Durand's. Oh, yeah! <laughs> I said, I sent this to you yeah, about yeah. seven years ago. Yeah. She said, oh, you know, sometimes I get to say, don't worry about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went in there. She said, okay, well, I've called around town, and the word is good. Um, when are you going to fire your agent? I said, well, I'm... Uh, I don't know. Can I do that? She said, She's like, yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> she said, drive over there now, come do the deal, come back here, and I'll have 20 pieces of copy for you to read. Mm. And I did, and the, the copy was going in with the booth directors and them putting you through the works. Yeah. The sort of mm -hmm. agency baptism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agency baptism. <laughs> it is a bit, yeah. Yeah, Hello. fire or otherwise. Sometimes yeah. it's nice holy water, but occasionally yeah. it's fire. Yeah. Um, and, and I did that, and she said, well, we haven't figured out what you can't do, so I'm going to give you everything. And, Beautiful. Uh, and don't go, I don't want you to meet anyone else. Sign yeah. on the dotted line. Let's do this. And I booked immediately, and I was, you know, it was just, it was just like, yeah. <laughs> recognize that you, I needed some power behind me. Totally, mm -hmm. man. But I, that wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted that to have happened before I was ready. You yeah, because that's a different Absolutely. kind of work Everything to, happens to, at the right know, time. To yeah. Up to, yeah. so. And Arlene and I have been you know, partners ever since. I adore her. And the, the older gentleman next to her was obviously Jack Angel, who was nice. working. Nice, yeah, exactly. Oh, so I, I love amazing. Jack. So wow. I love them both, that's yeah. amazing. So, and you're still with Arlene, still of with course. Yes. And yeah. she's fabulous. Hi, yeah. Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Um, Big old. So, very, very cool. Um, so, dude, we got to go there. All right, one of my favorite shows ever created, you were on it. Mm. And I want to know what it felt like to be on such a huge freaking <laughs> mega franchise that took over the world, Breaking Bad. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, and I, j I saw you on that. So what was it like to just, you know, be on a show that huge? Kind you must have been a little freaked great. out. Well, so, yeah, I did two. You said kind of great. <laughs> I, did, yeah. I did two episodes. Uh -huh. um, when I auditioned for the show, th there was people mentioning it, but it wasn't really a big deal. Um, you mean you didn't know? How no, big I didn't it really know much about because it because this was I, already deeper into. You I know. was yeah. Well, I, so while I was I was auditioning while season three was just being played. Okay. So that was just airing. Yeah. So the, the, there was buzz about it, but it wasn't like it hadn't become what it became by any means. Yeah. So I, uh, it was cast by Sharon Bialy and Sherry Thomas, who are very prolific. Mm -hmm. They do The Walking Dead now. They do, yep, you know, they're amazing. Yep. They've done I'm amazing like, shows. Mega, mega. They're very big, and yeah. they cast me in a couple of little things. And they brought me in, and I saw the words Breaking Bad, and I went, "Oh, is that that thing that everyone's been talking about?" <laughs> and of course, I'm walking in to play a Mexican doctor. Mm -hmm. It's like the writing's on the wall, Jamie. Because of course, yeah. Of course. My last five roles on camera are Mexican, uh, <laughs> Arab, Israeli, uh, Albanian, and, and Persian. Go figure. So, so I was suddenly, I, I auditioned, and it was, it was just on tape. I didn't get to meet Vince Gilligan or anything. I did the scene. She was like, that's great. And I had it. Mm. And yeah, I was I was shooting, you know, with suddenly with Aaron Paul and 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 Jonathan Banks and Giancarlo Esposito mm. uh, doing this scene, yeah. and it was nerve wracking. And it was I I, I I sort of once I got the job, I sort of looked into it a bit, and I was like, oh my god! And then I watched the show, and I was I was yeah. like, I'd never nothing had ever in a different way to the Sopranos, but but nothing had hooked me quite like this. That yeah. show is as addictive as the meth Completely. that it's about. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it still wasn't that big a deal. And so I, I sort of did it, and then it came out, and then you know the messages started coming, <laughs> flooding in. Oh my right? god, dude! Yeah. And that was that. Yeah. And then when I did, by the time I did the second episode, which was in season five. It had become a big deal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool, man. So Congratulations. That's Thank really, you. Yeah. really, really cool. And you know what? The nicest, most amazing crew, the most amazing people. Aaron Paul's an absolute yeah. gem. When I did the second episode, he saw me across the lot and ran over and was like, "Dude, oh my God, Mr. White, you're you know, you're back!" And and uh, yeah. it was it was just amazing, amazing so experience. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I'll tell you. I've got a funny story about the second episode, though. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Tell me a funny story. All right. So by the time <laughs> by the time I did the second episode, you know, the show had blown up and it was great. And I came back to tell. Tell, tell uh, Mike, who's played by Jonathan Banks, amazing, phenomenal actor, yep. that Gus had been killed. Um, we arrive uh, on set. Uh, it, it, it's supposed to be the Mexican desert. It's May in Albuquerque. <laughs> I get there at 5 a.m. 5.15, it starts snowing. Oh, no. And really snowing. It's dumping. Yeah. And we're supposed to be in the Mexican desert. Oh. So that didn't happen. And we That's got put on hold for a few days. And Jonathan Banks, who's a phenomenal actor, was like, oh, well, we got some time now. Can I get something to eat? Let's go get something to eat. So we, go, we went again. We ate. We talked. I love him. He's amazing. And we've remained friends. Um, and then he was like, can I go see a movie? Let's go, <laughs> we should go see, we go see a movie. Let's go see. He's the nicest man yeah, ever. Yeah, he comes yeah. in Beverly Hills Cop. He's a legend. Yeah, yeah. He's been in everything. He's so great, yeah. man. What a great And so character. we went to see War Horse. And we're watching. I'm watch, sitting there watching War Horse, which is a kind of passionate, romantic, glorious film <laughs> yeah. with yeah. Jonathan Banks. I'm thinking, what the hell is? Yeah. I'm pinching so myself. So cool. And halfway through the film, he leans over and he goes, "I'm being emotionally manipulated, and I'm loving every second of it." <laughs> he's, he's a, he's a card. And that, he Brilliant. basically plays himself. Yeah. Yeah. Kind you know of. What I mean, I mean yeah, to the extent that any yeah. actor does. But yeah, yeah, so principally. Cool. But wonderful. So cool. Yeah, it was great. That concludes part one. We're going to be back next week with part two with JB. Don't miss it. Absolutely. And in the meantime, keep up with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe right down there at the logo to our YouTube channel. We love you guys. Thanks for watching. And just remember, you, you always, always have, have time for a little buzz. buzz. Come on, come on, come on and get buzzed with us. Leo Buzz Weekly is sponsored by Chuck Duran's Demo That Rock. Rock. The voiceover demo producer to the stars is now available to you. Visit demosatrock.com and take your voiceover career to the next level. See you next time. And remember, you always have time for a little buzz.